for that introduction. Uh, so yeah, I'm a uh, Winton Fellow at the University of Warwick. So I feel like I just need one more stylized W like uh, symbol at the bottom of my screen there. So I'm working on it. Uh, so yeah, I'm talking today about the climate mapping of exoplanet work that I've been doing. Uh, so I want to start off with a nice picture of Jupiter, although not quite as nice as some of the ones we saw this morning. Those are really brilliant. I'll have to update these to this talk a little bit. Um, the reason I'm starting here is because you can see Jupiter is a, 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 a dynamic and interesting and very variable object across the whole of the disk. And there are different independent cloud formations and uh, dynamics going on there. Really, the point I'm trying to make is that planets are not points. So uh, why do we treat them in exoplanets as if they are? We, we quite often uh, uh, talk about a singular equilibrium temperature for a planet, a singular um, abundance of a certain element. And, and really, it, it doesn't make sense to talk about planets as points because they are, of course, like dynamic and interesting objects, just like Jupiter. Um, and one way that planets are not one-dimensional uh, is in their velocity field. So I've just brought up a, a plot from uh, Sherman et al. 2012. Uh, which shows uh, uh, so this is a, a planet sort of looking in as it trans looking in on a planet as it transits sort of expanded out the atmosphere. So this is how the velocity field of the planet's atmosphere would look to an observer in the Earth. So you can see you've got this classic equatorial jet uh, and also some polar flow coming towards you as well. So there's this large blue shift coming towards you. So uh, planets are certainly not one dimensional in their velocity field. <laughs> Um, and uh, there's a lot more you can get out of these, these predictions from these models. And uh, I feel like this talk is quite well placed now because you just had an hour of hearing about all of this from, from Emily. So that was a, a really good introduction for me. So thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, these, these models predict an awful lot about the dynamics of the planet atmosphere. Um, so they make specific and testable predictions about the velocity field uh, and about the presence of clouds and all sorts of other things. Uh, but how do you test this in real life? Uh, and to do that, you're going to need some form of spatial resolution. So uh, th this is why uh, Emily was talking about the, uh, um, the, the, the spatial scanning during secondary eclipse. That's one way of doing it. Uh, um, but you need, uh, uh, you need some way of spatially resolving the exoplanet atmosphere. And uh, what I really want to do is do this during transmission, because uh, transmission is uh, what my specialty is, what I'm interested in. So is there a way to break down the spatial resolution of the planet during primary transit so as the planet <coughs> moves in front of the star? So it's going to spend a portion of its time with only one limb in front of the star. Uh, uh, it is a little bit dark, maybe, the image. But you can see the, the star in the background there. And at the beginning of the transit, the planet is only one limb is over the star. And as you go through the transit, you have a center where the whole thing is covered. And then at the other end of the transit, the other limb of the planet is now transiting and the other one is off the star. So throughout the transit, you're going to have a differential weighting of what parts of the planet atmosphere are being uh, are having your transmission spectrum from as a function of time. So can you use this uh, to probe the two limbs independently? Uh, so there's a problem, of course, there always is. Hi uh, spectroscopy is complicated and difficult. Uh, and you've got, uh, you've got issues with the velocity field of everything else in the system. So the planet is moving, the Earth is moving with respect to the planet you're looking at, and the star itself is rotating. So this is the roster mclaughlin effect, where the velocity of the star that you're passing over as a function of time is changing. Uh, so this can uh, contaminate your transmission spectrum. So it's something that you have to take into account. Um, there's absorption in the Earth's atmosphere, of course. So, for example, if you're looking at sodium, like I, like I will be, uh, the Earth's atmosphere has sodium as well, and it also has water features near the sodium feature. So you have to take into account the, uh, the transmission of the Earth's atmosphere. But luckily, the solution uh, is, uh, is high-resolution spectroscopy. So because you've got all of these different velocities, uh, if you look at it with a high enough resolution spectrograph, then the, the, the velocities all, all separate out the features and uh, the changes in time separate out the features. And you can quite easily separate out the bits that you're interested in, the bits that you're not interested in but you have to take care to model it correctly. So uh, I did a study on HG189733B uh, a couple of years back. And so this was to, to see if this technique was viable, whether you could scan the limb of the planet as it transits. So uh, I found that uh, taking all of these things into account, it was possible that you could separate out the eastern and western limb contributions. And I was looking specifically at the absorption from sodium and seeing how the velocity of this absorbed sodium line changes as a function of time. Uh, and I found that you could separate out the velocity from the eastern and western limbs, such that you find uh, on the trailing uh, or, or western limb, you have a velocity of about five kilometers per second coming towards you. Uh, and, uh, and on the other side, two kilometers per second going away. 
So you have this uh, this rotation of the planet in the eastward jet, just as predicted in the models. Um, but if you average that out to bring it down to a one-dimensional point again, you get an average of a two-kilometer blue shift. And uh, this is very similar to what Snell et al. found in 2010 when they looked at HD 209458b. Now, they didn't spe spectrally resolve it like I did. They just looked at a singular one-dimensional point, and they got minus two kilometers per second. So it looks like you can... Uh, this two kilometers per second, if you break it out, you start seeing this equatorial jet and this extra rotation. Uh, there it goes. Uh, and this is a, a very close map to the kind of velocities and also the asymmetry in the velocities that uh, were expected from theory. So this is a, a, a plot from uh, the thing has gone off the bottom. There's another plot from Sherman, I think. Um, so it, the, the velocity signal. Uh, is, is higher in the blue shift because you've also got this polar region coming towards you as well. So where to go next from here? Uh, so I, I, I know I've shown this technique works uh, and I want to extend this analysis to more hot Jupiters, uh, also to search for trends in wind velocity, uh, and increase the spatial resolution a little further and expand from sodium to other absorbers uh, and also, one thing that really bugged me the last time around is uh, my, my plots apparently weren't very photogenically pleasing to some of the uh, press releases. Uh, and I got this wonderful quote from the register uh, that my graphics were charmingly crude. <laughs> uh, so that's kind of bugged me for years. And I, 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 I just want to I want to correct the record and make some nicer looking plots for, to, to demonstrate this effect in the future. Um, so. <laughs> the base that I'm going to use to do this with is Spider-Man. So some of you may have heard of this. This is the previous project I worked on. Uh, it's for uh, mapping uh, mapping exoplanets during phase curve and uh, and, and transit limbs and um, secondary eclipse scanning. Uh, it's, uh, I think I should get some sort of award for the most convoluted acronym ever, or backronym rather. You can just sort of see it at the top there. So it's the secondary eclipse and phase curve integrated with 2D temp erature mapping. So <laughs> just about works. Uh, so Spider-Man is the base, but I did get into a little bit of issues with the editor of the journal where they were worried that there might be a, a copyright claim from Marvel. So I thought, okay, so my next project, I'm looking now at transmission spectroscopy. I should be a bit more careful with my name selection. So I thought, you know, the dividing line between the light and dark part of the planetary body, that's, that's a good start. So that, that is, of course, the, the Terminator. And there's no way that anyone is going to get this confused when he's sort of pop culture reference. So I, I, I don't have to worry about getting in trouble. Uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, the, the basic outline of the code is it works in the same way that Spider-Man does, uh, which is it's an analytical geometric integrator. So to put it simply, the, the planet that you're looking at is split up into a small, <clears throat> into a small uh, number of, uh, of, of, of segments. And then you go through and you see as a function of time, uh, what portion of the segment is covered up by the star. And you can calculate this exactly and analytically. So it means you can make the code very fast, which means that you can do retrievals with it. So in this example, in the top left here, you see the planet is represented by this orange disk. Uh, and the star is a blue disk. And then in, you've got these exact geometric shapes that are marked out in between. You can, you can calculate the areas very quickly. Um, so in Terminator, you can, you can uh, set up this limb architecture however you like. So here I have a, an example hot Jupiter where I, I've split up. So you have these uh, enhanced velocity regions around the equatorial jet. Uh, and then the rest of the planet is, is just uh, represented by two polar regions. Uh, so you can set up however you like, and you can put different velocity fields in these sections for broadening the uh, uh, the, uh, the transmission spectrum however you like. Um, of course, you've got to worry about the star, so the limb darkening has to be taken into account. Uh, so I have a, a um, I have a full stellar model underneath for the transit spectrum, so you can correctly um, calculate the effects of the star. This also means that you take into account things like the center to limb variation in stellar lines. So you have this issue where um, where the trans, um, you have a position where the limb darkening changes as you go through a spectral line. So the limb darkening in the middle of the spectral line is different to the limb darkening outside the spectral line. Uh, so if you have a if you have a planet moving with a differential velocity and it goes basically the limb darkening that it's experiencing changes as a function of time. So you have to take that into account. Uh, and of course, we've also got the rest of the McLaughlin effect. So the star underneath has a velocity field added as well. So if you put all of this together. Uh, I've got a short movie here. You can see uh, the planet moving in both, uh, um, in both velocity and flux space. And at any moment now, as it comes in front of the star, 
you can see the transmission spectrum on the bottom left starts to change, and you'll start seeing the sodium feature come in. Uh, and then on the, see the sodium feature gets deeper, you've got contamination from the star and also from the planet's atmosphere in this example. Uh, and then on the right is just a, a trail plot, so it's showing this in two dimensions, so time is moving from top to bottom. So all of these effects are taken into account in the model. So I went back uh, and checked that this worked by analyzing the same data set that I did initially in my pilot study. So HD1 at 9733B again. Uh, now this time, all of the stellar effects are taken properly into account in ways that they, they weren't necessarily the first time around. Uh, but I found that this did not significantly affect my results in this instance. So the, the velocity stayed pretty similar to what I reported before. So uh, there's a, um, a, a blue shift coming towards you from the, uh, uh, from, the day, uh, from the west side and a red shift moving away on the eastern side. So that's all the same. And uh, I'll be reporting on this later with you. Uh, and then I moved on and I wanted to look at uh, another planet uh, and I wanted to try something a bit different as well. So WASP-49b is another good test bed scenario because it's uh, got this enormous, extremely deep sodium signal. So I, I plotted it to scale in the bottom left there. And you can see that the atmosphere, which is highlighted in red and blue for the velocity field, uh, is, the radius of the atmosphere is as big as the radius of the planet itself. So this is a, an enormous, more like an exosphere really than an atmosphere. Uh, so there's this huge big feature. Uh, um, which was reported in Wittenbach et al. 2017. Um, so is it possible to not only separate out the equatorial jet, but also to separate out and get another sort of point in your spatial resolution and separate out the polar regions from the equatorial regions? So I updated my model a little bit. And uh, so I've now got three velocities. So there's a velocity for the trailing and leading uh, equatorial regions of the planet, and then a singular polar velocity, which is for the north and south poles. Uh, and I applied this to the model and I did a, a Bayesian retrieval and I found that you did get a, a significantly improved fit by having this third velocity component. So now I find that the, uh, in this case, there's a trailing and leading velocity for this planet of both about four kilometers per second, so moving away in towards you. But you also get this separate blue shifted polar region moving towards you at one kilometer per second. And if you remember back to the beginning where I showed those plots from the theory papers, that's pretty much exactly what was expected, was that you would have this polar flow, uh, which, con which adds up together with the equatorial jets to get the, the full signal, uh, to get the full um, velocity space as a function of time. Uh, so you can see that it's a good bit of the model as well. On the bottom left there, um, this is just a single frame. So there are, uh, there are 40 individual exposures over three nights in this data set. Uh, and you can see that the sodium signal is visible and well-fitted in, in just one of these 40 frames. So you can imagine, imagine the amount of extra data that you've got effectively from doing this 40 times. And that's where the, the power of this fit comes from. Um, so to put this in context, I just want to pull up a, a nice plot from Colin Kamasek 2018. So this is a, a plot where I want to add more points to effectively because it's, a, it, it's looking at how the uh, expected velocity of the equatorial jet changes as a function of uh, different drag mechanisms. So this is what uh, Emily was talking about, how the, the drag is affecting the, uh, the velocity that you see, and that, that affects both the, the, the offset of hotspots, but also the, um, the, the velocities that I can measure. Uh, and so I see that in, in this case, I've put on WASP 43B now as a yellow point, uh, and the other two points are for 209 and 189. So the 189 is the one that I measured earlier. So uh, uh, there's only three points here now. Uh, I want to add a few more. Um, and that should be able to really, as you, as you imagine, putting in more planets in different, different regions of the parameter space, you're going to be able to distinguish between uh, the shear instability model and the, magnetis and the magnetic drag model. So this will really allow you to look at different physical mechanisms for a drag in, in next planet atmospheres. Uh, and finally, I just wanted to do a little advertisement for uh, Diana. Uh, so uh, Diana Powell is leading a project which I've been uh, working on with her recently. Uh, so there's, uh, she's got this really nice uh, um, cloud model for exoplanets, which is a full microphysical model. Uh, and she's done, uh, she's resolved around the limb of the planet uh, the different cloud, um, the different cloud covering fractions that you get as a function of limb angle. So you've got this inhomogeneous cloud model. Uh, and what I've, what I've contributed to this is to show how this signal would actually be observable as a function of time in a JWST transit. So you can use Terminator to put different amounts of cloud on the two different sides of the planet coming from the model. Uh, and then that um, gives you a time variable signal in a JWST transit, which would allow you to confidently detect inhomogeneous clouds. If you want to talk about that more, then go uh, speak to Diana. She's got a poster up today, or is it tomorrow? 
or is it the next session tomorrow? It will be up at some point. So go chat to her about this. Uh, so yeah, I will uh, just leave my conclusions up on the screen and I'll finish there. So thank you very much for your time. Thanks so much, Tom. This is really amazing. Um, so I'm looking at the room for a lot of hands to raise. Please raise your hands if you want to ask questions. Okay. Okay, Jean-Michel. Bye, Network. Um, so for was 49 the, what is the pressure of the wind that you're measuring? Do you have an idea of uh, pressure level? Um, it's going to be low. We're down sort of below the millibar. It, it's 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 way up in this exosphere. So I, I, I yeah, I, I don't have an exact figure, but it's very low. Any more? So please uh, don't forget to uh, tell your name or your st institution before asking your question. Hi, Adam Showman, University of Arizona. This is uh, really interesting. I was curious to ask about data sets. Um, as I re recollect from your paper a few years ago, you used HARPS and were looking at the sodium D yes. line. And I was just curious to get your take on that versus um, like the cryres, like really, you know, sort of near infrared. Um, and then um, I, I guess also you didn't use cross correlation just because yeah. the line is so huge. And maybe you just comment on, on that issue as well. Yeah, so that, that that's one of um, uh, one of the advantages of working in the optical with the um, with the sodium line is it, it's a very deep singular line. You don't have to use cross correlation for it necessarily, uh, and the telluric contamination isn't as bad in the optical as it is in the near infrared. So there's there's a lot of things which which help you when looking at this one specific line. Um, but it's definitely possible to do in the infrared as well. So I mean, is your take that um, is there a preference of one versus the other, or does it depend on the system, or like you know, like how would you kind of judge that? I would say it probably does depend to some extent on the system, but um, uh, I, I would, in some ways it is easier to use optical right now with the instruments we have, but it's, it's not, it, 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 there's nothing stopping it from being done in the thread. It's something I'm looking at. Thank you. Any more questions? We got two and then I think we're gonna be done. Uh, I just have a small question. What, what's the lower limit of the wind speed that can be detected? Uh, using these techniques. The, 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 what are the limits on it? L lower limit of the wind speed on the planet. Um, the so the error bars I'm I'm getting so it's probably probably about you could confidently detect down to about a kilometer per second really any any lower than that and uh, that that's pretty much the limit with the error bars I currently have. But with uh, with large telescopes and new instrumentation you could do a bit better. So with ELT you could go a bit lower expect. But with HARPS yeah about a meter a kilometer per second is probably the limit. Eric Guidance, University of Hawaii. Uh, I guess for WASP 49B, sort of continuing on the Adams qu uh, query, or actually, I think it was um, Jean Michel, um, do we actually expect equatorial flow to continue up to the level where we see these extended atmospheres? I, I'm a little surprised. Yeah. That I, actually, I, the, the, the flow structure is preserved at that level, and, and you can punt if that's. I, Honestly, I have the same question. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know what, I, for, for this level in the atmosphere, I'm actually not sure what is expected, but that's what I've detected. Okay, thanks so much, Tom. Thank you.